Point number two is this. Genesis does not equal Genesis. Now, this is going to be very interesting. Some of you are going to scratch your head and say, what do you mean here? Let me explain. Unitarians are right that in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, the Greek word that's used for now the birth of Jesus was in this way is the word Genesis in the Greek. However, contrary to their commentary on this verse in the Revised English Version, the Greek word for Genesis is not synonymous with the English word for Genesis in the biblical literature. Let me just walk through some points here. They are incorrect, ultimately incorrect, in teaching that Matthew 1.18 is the ultimate genesis of Jesus, okay? Now, let's go back to their text where they said it. They said this, and notice, this is what they wrote. The word genesis points to the fact that God impregnating Mary not only led to Jesus' birth, I agree with that statement, but, and here's where the problem occurs, but was in fact his origin and beginning. In other words, they're saying that when Matthew said, now the birth of Jesus was in this way, what he really meant to say was now the origin, the beginning of Jesus was in this way. You may even hear Unitarians when they're teaching a lesson, they'll say the genesis of Jesus was in this way. And that's incorrect. Let me explain. First of all, very simply, and I'm going to make a very strong challenge here that Someone who is a Unitarian can easily refute me. The Greek word Genesis is never synonymous with the English word Genesis. When you mean Genesis in English, we usually mean ultimate origin of existence. Ironically, the Greek word Genesis, as it's translated into English, is never synonymous with the English word Genesis in the entire Greek Bible. That's the Septuagint, the LXX of the Old Testament and the Greek New Testament. Now, all it would take is one clear example, preferably two, but one clear example to disprove me. However, there are none. There are none. How do I know? Because I can show you, and I'll actually bring up a, um, a website here and just show you. Let's take the Blue Letter Bible. This is something that is free, anyone can use. You can go and you can either search on the Strong's uh, 1078, or you can actually look up the actual Greek word uh, using the Greek letters, uh, Genesis, and they'll bring up all the instances. When you search against the Old Testament LXX, the Septuagint, it brings up 39 examples, and it parses them out, shows them the different cases and forms that it appears. And you can also, when you go to the New Testament, the Greek New Testament, you can also find the, um, the examples that are there, the five examples that are there. Now, what I did, just to, um, just to help you out here, so what I did is I went to, you know, using Blue Letter Bible, I went and I took all of the examples where the word Genesis occurs in its various forms. And I basically put the Greek text, I put the reference, the Greek text, I put this actual Greek form, whether it's singular or plural, I put the actual example so you could see it. I put the contextual words that are surrounding it that contribute to its meaning. And then I show you what the vast majority of translations actually translated as and why. I won't go through all of the details, but here are all of the examples, all 44 of them listed out. What you basically find is this. They all center around a few definitions. The first thing you need to know is that Unitarians are incorrect in saying that the word, the Greek word Genesis is the same as the English word Genesis. This is what's known as the etymological fallacy. Meaning, they are correct that it is related to the, to, the, to, the, to the verb genomai and genao, that gen word group, and that it did originally probably have that connotation of origin and existence. However, that's not how you do in translation and interpretation. What happens is you go to a lexicon. That's this. And they actually reference a lexicon that I actually have in, the, um, in their article. And when you take a lexicon and you actually look up the entry for that particular word, what you'll notice, as it does in this lexicon here, this is the BDAG, but you can look at Kittle, you can look at Thayer's, you can look at other uh, lexicons, and there's even others like Mounts that are more modern. And what you can find is they actually have multiple entries in for a given word. And what you'll notice, and this is very powerful, what you'll notice is that the lexicons just don't list out um, 
you know, uh, the, the meanings and leave you to go and figure out on your own how to apply which meaning in a particular context. No, the lexicons actually list which verses are applicable to which meanings. So yes, in a number of lexicons, they have beginning, origin, and descent. However, what you will notice is that when they go through, they will explain what the word can also mean. So for example, in the BDAG lexicon, they have entry, lexical entry number one. That does not mean that that is the prominent entry. That means that they're going through different literature as ancient as the the Iliad, written by Homer and, and, and works of Plato. This is what they see. These are examples that they see, and they list those examples. However, even in this lexicon, when they list number one, beginning, origin, and descent, they actually include birth. And guess what example they give as an example of that? Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Meaning that the people who put the lexicon together, who look at the contextual clues of what a word means in a given context, when they looked at that particular word, they saw that the dominant, predominant meaning for these uses is birth. Okay, so the next thing that we need to see here is how can we determine what the actual meaning is? So when you look at the list that I provided, and like I said, I'll, I'll make this a list available in the description, is in the spreadsheet, when you go through all 44 examples in the Greek Bible, that's the LXX and the Greek New Testament, looking up the word Genesis as it appears in Matthew 1.18, what you'll find is essentially it consolidates around a few meanings. So first off, we have, as expected, we have the predominant meaning, which is the generations of. When that word is used in plural in, in, the, in the Bible, what you'll find is that the predominant meaning for Genesis in the plural, uh, and here we have it obviously in the nominative plural feminine, and what we see is that it's the generations of, and you see it used throughout Genesis, you also you see it used in Chronicles uh, quite a bit, and some other places. It is very clear that is exactly what it means. Now, one of the, the things that you'll find is that this in the book of Genesis actually becomes a uh, controlling device for the narrative of Genesis. It's actually very important, even in the original Hebrew and the writers of the Septuagint, when they translated from the Hebrew to Greek, they carried over that same consistent controlling device by using the word generations. It does not mean, it does not mean the beginnings of or the origins of. And the, the Unitarians, when they do their translation, they recognize that. Another thing that happens in the book of Genesis as well is it actually, in, in two places when they Septuagint did, did their translation, you'll see them put the book of the genealogy. And the difference here is it's still the same word Genesis, but it is in the genitive singular feminine, which means it's that possessive case, and it's a singular use, but it's preceded by the word biblos, hey biblos, which means the book. And it's Genesios, which is the book of genealogy. And, you know, true to form, that's how it's used from Genesis 2 4 and Genesis 5 1. Now, there have been some who have attempted to say that Genesis 2 4 may possibly contain the meaning of beginnings and origins. Even if I granted that, that still is not the dominant way that the word Genesis is used. However, thankfully, the New English translation online, the Net Bible, if you look up their Genesis 2-4 entry, they actually will explain, well, even there, it is consistent with the rest of Genesis, and it means that which comes forth from something, that which is produced out of it, and even in Genesis 2-4 for the heavens and the earth, they make a great case that the controlling device of generations, the word Genesis, means what it means throughout Genesis, and you look at examples like Genesis 37 and 2, uh, where you, you have basically the generations of Jacob, you clearly see that it has to do with what comes forth from Jacob because the subsequent narrative has nothing to do with verse. It has to do with what comes out from his line. And so it's very, it, that's the predominant use of the word, the Greek word Genesis in the Greek Bible. Now, what's amazing about that, just as a confirmation, the example in the New Testament is actually Matthew 1 and 1. When we go to Matthew 1 and 1 in the, in the New Testament, what you'll find is that it actually uses the, the word Genesis as well. And you will notice, and this is one of the first clues that my argument is even consistent with the Unitarians, is that when you go to Genesis 1 and 1, they have a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. 
That is the exact same thing, the book of the Genesis of Jesus Christ. However, they do not translate it as the book of the Genesis of Jesus Christ because they know from the what follows that these are the genealogical records of Jesus' ancestors. And even the concluding verse 17 tells us that. So all of the generations from Abraham to David, right? And when you click on their verse in verse one, you'll see that they don't reference Genesis, the word Genesis, nor do they attempt to make their argument from Matthew chapter one, verse one, even though the word Genesis is used there, but they're recognizing the contextual clues on how this word is predominantly used, especially with the word book of the generation of Jesus Christ or the Genesis of Jesus Christ. It definitely means genealogy. And that's how you do exegesis. And you'll even see that in the lexicons, but let's go even further. So that's the predominant use. Let me show you the next uh, common use of the word Genesis. It is either for a natural birth or a natural body or a natural life. And that is the second most prominent use in the biblical literature. Where do we begin with this? It begins in the book of Genesis. We have several examples where the word Genesis is used and it definitely means birth. I'm just gonna point out one or a few examples from the Old Testament just to make this point strong. But in Genesis 40 verse 20, if you look up in the English translation and, and throughout this, I'll even bring up occasionally the uh, new English translation of the Septuagint just to show you that. But even there, it talks about Pharaoh celebrating his birthday and what is used what the word for day is used, but it also uses the word for Genesis, his Genesis day. Now he was not celebrating the day of his conception. And I'll give you more uh, confirmation of that. He was celebrating his birthday. And that's what the word predominantly means. It can mean the land of your birth, the people of your birth, other things of that nature. Let's go through. Uh, there's quite a few that I would like to bring out, like Ezekiel 4.14, where Ezekiel actually complains to God when God asked him to eat something unclean. And Ezekiel says, I have not eaten anything unclean from my Genesis until now. And he's clearly talking about his birth because Ezekiel would not be eating food while he was, you know, be after right after he got conceived, right? The clearest example, though, this is the definitive example in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 16, 3 and 16, 4. I want to actually bring that up using the New English translation of the Septuagint. If you ever want to um, read the Septuagint and you're saying, you know what, hey, uh, I, I don't know Greek, but I want something that gives me a nice English translation of the Septuagint. And you're looking for a version that actually does that. I highly, highly recommend um, the uh, University of Pennsylvania. They have a online version of the New English uh, translation of Septuagint. I'll add this link in the description. And it gives you, in my opinion, one of the best English translations of the Septuagint done by Oxford Press through multiple editions with multiple subsequent editors. It is a solid translation. And if you read my book, uh, you'll notice that I, I quote from it quite a bit when I want to use an English translation of the Septuagint. But when we go to the book of Ezekiel, okay, now it's not directly searchable, it's searchable, it's actually in PDF format. But when we go to the book of Ezekiel uh, on this, Ezekiel 16, and this is an English translation of the actual Greek. That's why I'm using. I'm not just doing an English translation of the Hebrew because that could potentially be different. I'm using an actual English translation of the actual Greek to show you how translators translate this when they read the word Genesis. Genesis chapter 16, verse 3, God has given a figurative analogy about Israel and how he discovered them and how they were, really they were nobodies before God found them. And he uses the example of them from birth. But what is very interesting here is it actually includes a description of a word for a root or origins, but it also uses a different word for birth, that's Genesis, but then it explicitly explains what it means by the birth or when it refers to birth. Let's go into this. Ezekiel 3, 16 verse three, it says, and you shall say, this is what the Lord says to Jerusalem. Your origin, now that's a different word. It actually means root. Your origin and your birth, those are two distinct things, is from the land of Canaan. Your father is an Amorite and your mother a Chittite. And as for your birth, now this is the word Genesis. It's the same word that's used here for birth in 16.3. It's the same word that's used here. It's the same word in Matthew 1.18. Now notice what it says. And as for your birth, he's actually going to explain the birth. What happened on the day of their birth? He says, in the day that you were born. And he uses a word that clearly decisively means born. So the day of your birth, when you were born, is the same as you being 
physically born. They did not bind your breast, and you were not bathed with water. You were not salted with salt, and you were not wrapped in cloths, right? And he basically talks about how they were just cast aside. Nobody showed them love, but God did. Now, he's explicitly describing what happens when a child is born, the cleaning process, and the uh, and what are called the, the sanitization of the, the child, even wipe, wrapping the child in cloths like Mary does in the Gospel of Luke, where she takes Jesus and wraps him in swaddling cloths. In the ancient world, this is what they did to you in the day that you were born, not when you were conceived. And this is the Greek word for Genesis. Now, that's a powerful example. You can remember that. Ezekiel 16, 3 and 4, that puts it to rest. That is one of the most explicit examples of what happens to babies when they are born on, in the Bible, and it uses the word Genesis multiple times there. Now, there are other examples I could go through, but most importantly, when we get to Matthew 1, 18, it is the exact same word, and it means birth. Similarly with other verses throughout, James has a two instances where he uses, where he takes a, 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 a use of Genesis, which means natural body uh, or natural uh, life. And that, that also applies. That comes from that meaning of this is what you were when you were born. Okay. Now, with that said, let me just uh, for a second here, just, just kind of reframe this. So what I'm actually saying, and as I've been making out clear, hopefully clear throughout this entire discussion is the Greek word Genesis does not mean what we typically mean by the English word Genesis. And that is because our English word is likely derived from the book of Genesis, and it has this concept of beginnings. You cannot take what a word means in a modern language and then read that meaning back into the original Greek word and assume that that's what it means in all these places. That is not how you do exegesis. Let me add a further example. We have words like this that we use today. For example, I'll take the word genes, right? There is actually a Greek word, gamma, epsilon, nu, epsilon, sigma, right? And there's a whole word group associated with that. And we would pronounce that word genes. And if I would say, hey, genes, we know what genes are. That's your, that's your DNA information. That's your DNA code. And when I look at the Bible, it actually has this Greek word uh, genes, you know, gamma, epsilon, nu, epsilon, sigma. And therefore, that means your DNA code. Now, you see what I did there? I took the modern meaning of genes and I tried to put it back in a Greek word for genes. And I didn't go and I look at and look at the lexicon, the lexical entries to see if that is one of the meanings that is applied to the particular verses that I am using. That is, that's an example. And I'm going to say it point blank. That's an example of eisegesis. Here's another word that we have like that. It's the word apology, right? Now, what do we mean when we say in English an apology, right? If I do something wrong and I need to apologize to my children, maybe I did something wrong and I need to now correct, say, you know what, I, I'm sorry, kids, I did something wrong here. And we know what that means. I'm, I'm saying, please forgive me for doing something wrong, right? Apology. Now, here's the thing. There's a Greek word from which we get our English word, and it's apologia, and it's used in 1 Peter chapter 3, and it means not to give not to request forgiveness before doing something wrong. It means to give a well-reasoned defense, almost in a court of law or before a tribunal or before an official group of people. And when Peter says, be prepared to give a defense of the hope that you have within you, that's the word that he used, apologia, and it's used elsewhere. But it does not mean to ask forgiveness of. Imagine me reading 1 Peter chapter 3.16 and say, wait a minute, the Greek word is apology or apologia. What Peter's telling us to do is to apologize for our faith and say, I'm sorry for what I believe, for the hope that I have. No one would make that argument. But that is exactly, and in one case, even more so, what the Unitarians, the basic level Unitarians, are doing with the word Genesis in Genesis chapter 1, verse 18. They're basically saying, well, our modern word in, in English means beginnings and origins. Therefore, when I read Genesis chapter 1, verse 18, it means all that. This is the Genesis of Jesus. Not in English, it's not. It is the birth of Jesus. And that's what you have to keep in mind. Now, hopefully my point is clear, but let's put it well over the top. So, and I'm just going to share my screen. So finally, let's, let's put this over the top. So I'm saying the Greek word Genesis does not equal what the English word Genesis does. 
predominantly, in fact, exclusively in the Greek Bible. You cannot show me an example. My challenge would be for you to Terrence, who show me one example or two where it necessarily, universally must mean that. And that's all they need to do to disprove me. But I don't have a, uh, I, I'm not, not worried that they're going to find an example. I want to make this point. This is going to actually bl really blow you away. The greatest surprise is not even the book of Genesis uses the word Genesis the way that the Unitarians are attempting to do in Matthew 118. What do I mean? There is one famous verse that we all know is definitively like a ultimate origin passage. In fact, it's the one in Western culture that we all go back to. It's the first verse in the book of Genesis. In the beginning, God. Now, you know one of the biggest surprises? In the Septuagint, in Genesis, even though the book is named Genesis, in the beginning, they do not use the word Genesis. They use a different expression. They use the two words, NRK, NRK, in the beginning, God created. Now, you know what's amazing about this? And this is the, the irony. When we get to Matthew, he doesn't use NRK. This is the NRK of Jesus or the RK of Jesus. What he does, he actually uses Genesis, which is the word that's used for birth in the very book of Genesis and throughout the Bible, or genealogy, our record of genealogy. But there is a book in the New Testament that takes the phrase NRK exactly as it appears in Genesis 1 and 1 in the Septuagint and applies it to Jesus, but not to say this is his beginning. It says he was in the beginning. That's John chapter one reads very much the same as Genesis one and one in the Septuagint in the beginning in our K. However, instead of, instead of saying this is Jesus beginning when God made him, it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. Just as God, we're not told of God's origin in Genesis, and we later learn that he was from the beginning to now and forever will be, or from everlasting to everlasting. When John begins the Gospel of John, the, the expression he reaches for is the NRK, the, 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 the origin. But he basically says, in the origin of creation, Jesus already was, and he was with God. That's profound. That is an absolute ironic twist of events for the Unitarians. Meaning, if you actually study all of the Gospels, you find out that they do tell us about the ultimate origin, but not of Jesus. They tell us he was when the ultimate origin of creation began. We also have even the Revised English transvert Translation, when it reaches the word Genesis, it uses, it, it uses the word for birth as in Luke chapter 114 for John the Baptist. And also they correctly, and this is, this is very matter of factly, even in Matthew 118, in their translation, when they see the Greek word Genesis, they translate it as birth. Now, I'll show you this on the screen. So in their own translation, where they provide this note in verse 118, they actually translate it as, now the birth of Jesus Christ happened this way. Now, if they're committed to what they have here in the notes, why didn't they translate it as in the beginning was the, as they, as they say here, was the, was the origin of Jesus, right? Or the genesis of Jesus. They could have even put that there, right? And said, hey, it says Genesis in the Greek. We're going to put Genesis. No, they actually translate it correctly and put the word birth. So even in their own translation, they acknowledge that birth is the most likely rendering. And that's a Unitarian translation. So there's no uh, non-Unitarian bias there, okay? So with all that said, what I want to point out is this word does not mean what they're claiming it to mean. They're taking, they're doing an etymological fallacy, engaging in an etymological fallacy, a fallacy of et etymology, where they're saying, you know, the word originally mean this long ago, and therefore all of the uses must mean that, which they clearly don't believe. But they're attempting to make that the point so that when you read Genesis 118, you'll start to say, now the genesis of Jesus was in this way. You should not say that unless you're pronouncing the Greek word and you immediately explain that it means birth. With that said, this first part has shown you very clearly that number one, that the Unitarians are, example, are operating at, with a canon within a canon. Secondly, they are attempting to read into the Greek meaning what the original, what the, what I should say, the later 
English meaning has for us. They're reading that back into the word or maybe even saying what it once meant long ago. They're reading into the word and that is incorrect. That is not how you do interpretation. The challenge would be all they have to do is find one example, maybe two examples from the Greek Bible that necessarily definitely must mean origin and beginning without question. Everyone would agree or the majority of people would agree. They can't do it. It doesn't exist. You'll see the link to my spreadsheet in the description. I hope you've enjoyed this. We have coming up next. We're actually going to go deeper in Matthew and Luke because I don't want you to think that Matthew and Luke somehow do not discuss or give us the clues or the indications that Jesus Christ existed prior to his birth. I want you to be able to see throughout how they actually lay the groundwork for this and how it ties into the rest of the New Testament, which we will address in subsequent points. As always, remember us in prayer. And if you like this video, give us a thumbs up and grace and peace times two. Thank you for watching.